And welcome to the final planning and zoning meeting of 2022 and the first ever planning and zoning meeting at 6 p.m. Um, I think we're I think we're finding some unanticipated issues with with Vero Beach traffic at 6 p.m. So um, welcome uh, uh, to this meeting and um, we'll call it to order and start with the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, any additions or deletions to um, the agenda? No, sir. None? I would like to say none. Okay. Comments at the end. Okay. All right. So, under um, commissioners matters. Under commissioner matters. Okay. Okay. That's where we'll put you. In fact, I'll write you in right now so I don't forget. Um, okay. Good. So you're on my list. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so um, the the first order of business is uh, approval of the minutes of October 13th, 2022. Mr. Chair, I would move to approve. We have a move to approve. We have a second. I have a comment, Mr. Chairman. All right. Um, on um, the one issue in the minutes, uh, I was opposed with 1S, but um, there's nothing in the minutes that indicate why I was opposed. In other words, I was never quoted anywhere saying anything. And so I think, and this is not a personal uh, criticism, but um, you know, I think in the, in the future, if someone's opposed, it ought to, there at least ought to be some hint as to why. All right. Um. Duly noted. Uh, are you okay with the minutes as is for now, though? And we'll make it a point there. Thank you. Isn't the word opposed misspelled? Yes. That's why I said opposed. Oh, with one S. Opposed okay. with one Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> we, we'll correct that as well. All right. When so you do all caps, it doesn't do the spell check. We have a motion to approve. We have uh, a second. We have a comment. Um, and will that comment be recorded? Uh, for future reference, yes. I think as far as the minutes are, we'll correct the spelling error, and then we'll make it a point to note those in the future. All right. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Um, so the minutes are, are passed with um, the, the caveat that Mark um, brought up. So we have three, uh, four agenda items tonight. Um, three of them are uh, quasi-judicial and there is one public hearing. Uh, so we'll start with the first agenda item, which is um, um, <laughs> the uh, Orchid Island uh, Orchid Reserve townhomes. And this is a request for a major site plan and preliminary plat approval for a 100 unit residential plat oversight plan development uh, to be known as Orchid Reserve. Uh, DR Horton Incorporated is the um, applicant. Um, Mosteller and Moeller Incorporated is the agent. This is located uh, north of County Road 510, east of Highway 1, U.S. Highway 1. Uh, the zonings are RM6, residential multifamily, up to six units per acre, um, um, and OC, uh, office commercial residential and conservation estuarine wetlands conservation district. The land use designations are L2, low density, residential two, up to six units per acre, um, and uh, commercial, industrial, and conservation too. Um, so any declaration of ex parte communications uh, in, on the board for this? Okay, and so why don't we go ahead and swear in everyone who wants to speak tonight on any of the agenda items, please get sworn in now. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Uh, very good, and uh, staff presentation, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, tonight we'll have Brandon Cregan uh, present this item. Good evening, Chair and members of the board. Before you tonight is the Orchid Reserve modification of the major site plan and a plat oversight plan preliminary plat. 
property is approximately 27.27 acres. 16.72 uh, acres is the developable land and 10.45 acres is estuarine wetland. Um, it's gonna be 100 residential units. So the density comes out to 5.98 units an acre. Um, the site has <coughs> RM6, OCR, and CON2 zoning. I'd like to note that uh, no residential density will be derived from the CON2 zoning, and all residential density will be derived from the RM6 and OCR zoning districts, which are uh, six units to the acre for both of them. This is going to be a single phase development, and I'd also like to make special note that in 2006, uh, this board approved a 100 unit residential development on this site, um, but there's a slightly different layout and configuration before you tonight, so it's virtually the same project. So as noted, the property is north of County Road uh, 510, uh, east of US Highway 1, and west of 44th Avenue. And as you can see on the site, this is uh, what the property currently looks like in its current platted configuration um, based off the approval from 2006. Uh, this is the area of what the uh, configuration before you tonight is going to be. Um, and then just a little closer look. Uh, you can see that there's just some subtle changes. You can see some of the residential buildings have now been moved uh, to the U.S. Highway 1 side of the project. Um, and there's been a, a little bit of spacing between the buildings that have been spaced out. And there's also been um, some clearing for a clubhouse and some open space to the internal western portion of the project uh, abutting the stormwater pond. Traffic circulation shows an internal loop road that goes around the perimeter of the site. There's going to be a one gated access to the site, and there's also a U.S. Highway 1 connection along with the northbound right turn lane. Stormwater pond is in the interior of the site. Uh, the stormwater pond does exist on the site today. <coughs> Landscape plan shows our um, regular uh, perimeter buffers as, long as, the r as well as the required uh, roadway buffer. Um, to the west of the site, which is the 10.45 uh, acres, is the estuarine wetlands, and it's also currently a conservation easement over those wetlands as well. Uh, the dedication improvements of the site are the US-1 sidewalk and roadway buffer, the internal sidewalk and pedestrian system, uh, street lighting, and common green space and recreation areas. Staff recommends that the Plan and Zoning Commission grant a modified major site plan and preliminary plat, plat over site plan approval for the Orchid Reserve project with the conditions listed in the staff report. These conditions revolve around the final landscape plans and street lighting designs, the final tree protection and mitigation plan, the construction of the northbound right turn lane on US-1, as well as the US-1 sidewalk, uh, the installation of the landscape buffer and improvements, the street lighting improvements, all common area and project sidewalks, and lastly, the six foot wide sidewalk easement either prior to or through the final plat process. I'm available for any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Um, commissioners, any questions? I do. All right, and I, I see Chip does too, so we'll start at this end and move this way. Okay, uh, I noticed that the impervious area was, um, I didn't calculate the percentage, but well over 95%. That's Is that correct? The, I think it's a typo. The, all right, let's see here. In the, in the, are you t on the staff report? So page two, item six? Yeah, page two, item six. <clears throat> the site? Yeah, the, that 27.27 in previous area, 27.17. So if you run the yeah, that can't, that, footage that, out. That, that can't be right because, that, yeah, that would be close to 90%. If you uh, the reduction, there is a reduction in the total in previous area. That, I wonder if that was versus the... Um, RM6 OCR. It probably it. was. It, yeah, it, 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 pro a typo. it, it was probably excluded the the <laughs> Escher and Wetland area. I can try. I to can do. tell you that if you divide the number of square feet, 314,000, by the number of square feet in a an acre, 43,560, that actually comes out to 7.211 acres. So I saw the same thing that, that Mark did. Yeah, then that's, that's clearly right. that's clearly a, a, a type of numbers. Yeah, because if you go into the uh, note section, uh, the last project was 338,897 square feet. This project's 314,135 square feet, which represents a reduction of 24,762. So. I think. Yeah. Okay. Are we done with that? Sure. Yeah, I think the issue is the, the overall is much, should be much larger. Okay. And um, this is modifying a major site plan, but 
uh, and this is because I'm new, I guess, it's only a preliminary plat. Um, isn't a, a site plan usually the final step? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Beecher, it, yes and no. This is a, com a combined effort. It's a, it's a site plan and a plat. A site plan by itself is, in fact, the final step. But if they're choosing to plot over to create fee simple lots, in that, in that term, that kicks them into the subdivision process where they have to do the LDP and then ultimately the final plot. But if they were just going to do single ownership uh, units, rentals, and not plot, then site plan would be the final step. Okay, so the, the platting plat component. Preliminary, there's more correct. steps, but this correct. is the final site plan? Correct, yes. The configuration won't change. Okay. Thank you. Alan, did you have comments? Yeah, just a couple of quick questions. I noticed the approval that we're modifying occurred way back in 06, 16 and a half years ago. Did, does our approval from 06 ever expire? Or is it just kind of continue all this time? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Alan, the, uh, a couple of things. One, that so that project broke ground, obviously. They, they dug the pond. We also back then allowed bonding up, up to 100%. So they, they platted the, the project. So it's ultimately vested and, in theory, could come back at any day and start pulling permits under that scenario. But they're, they're changing it as well. So hence the reapproval. And the, the buildings are, it's a number of townhouses in a single building. Is that right? Correct. And the plat it says individual lots. Apparently, there's a lot line down a joint wall Correct. through the middle of this Correct. building. Uh, yes. And, and people buy that lot Correct. and get essentially some type of joint agreement or party wall or something like that. Precisely. Okay. I, I had one more question, if you will. And the townhouses, are those uh, one car garages or how do you get two parking spaces out of these townhomes? Uh, one car in the garage, one car in the in the driveway. Okay, and then the driveway is long enough for the full length of a standard vehicle. Yes. And and that's all, maybe. I mean, we don't have any dimensions here. Um, we we have fully dimensioned and engineered. Okay, I'm sure you do. Yeah, but uh, and then where do guests park? There are about a half a dozen spaces at the clubhouse, um, but otherwise it would be. Uh, it would that be could conceivably to. be a long walk, I guess. Yes, right? depending on where you're Is visiting. It, and that's kosher? Yes, we don't have a requirement for, for visitor parking over and above this, the minimum. Hmm. Mr. Chairman, should we? <laughs> <laughs> it's a different discussion for a, for a, uh, for a different day. I know it's a different discussion. But. Any questions on this side? I know, Chip, you did. Uh, I did. Um, can you go back to the site plan? What, 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 uh, one more, I think it is. Yeah, that one. Um, <clears throat> first of all, what is the threshold as far as an emergency access point? 100 units on the dot. Yeah. So, I, so, so over 100. On so 101, they would. 101, yes. Okay. Um, and then what is the access to somebody coming from the north side, uh, north US-1? How do they it's, it's, do a U-turn? Uh, you have to you do, you have to U-turn. It's, it's media and protected at that area, and it's right in, right out. OK. Um, and actually, can you go back to that one again? Uh, one more question. The one where I was? Yeah, right there is good. Um, at the bottom of it, I'm reading State Road Ditch Right of Way. Mm -hmm. What is that? That's a, that's a DOT drainage canal from US-1 to the river. But that's outside of the limits of the project. OK. All right. Well, that, so it's not a road. It'll just be a drainage area. Yeah, it, yeah it's an existing, probably overgrown ditch. Yes. OK. Any other commissioner questions? Um, I'll open the floor for comments from the public if anyone wants to make a comment on this. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, for the record, I'm Steve Moeller from Mastella Moeller. We're representing D.R. Horton on the Orchard Reserve project. Uh, appreciate Ryan and Brandon's um, presentation. Uh, they did such a good job, we don't have anything to add. But if there's any questions you have, I know you've had some, but I think 
they answered them. Um, but if there's any others, I'd be glad to answer them. Thank okay. you, Steve. Any questions for Steve? Looks like none. Thank you. Um, any additional questions? Call for motion. Move approval with, with staff conditions. Okay, we have a move to approve and a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, passes unanimously. Our second um, quasi-judicial um, uh, agenda item tonight is Harbor Bluffs PD Phase 3. And this is a request for a preliminary PD plan plat approval for a 60-unit multifamily residential development to be known, known as Harbor Bluffs PD Phase 3. Uh, Pulte Home Company LLC is the owner. Um, Kotler and Hearing LLC is the agent. Uh, it's located on the west side of a future county road, 11th Drive, south of 41st Street. The zoning is PD, planned development. The land use designation is CI, commercial industrial. Uh, density is 3.37 units per acre. Um, and we have um, sworn in participants, um, ex parte, Communications? None. Um, planning uh, and zoning presentation, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, uh, for the record, Ryan Sweeney, Chief of Current Development, and uh, Patrick Murphy, Senior Planner, will be handling this item. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, Mr. Murphy. Uh, it's off. Um, yeah, right there. Until it turns red. You got to push it. Through. There you go. There we go. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, Patrick Murphy, Senior Planner, Current Development. As the chairman stated, this is Harbor Bluffs PD Phase 3, preliminary PD plan plat. This is the third phase of an overall project. Um, just to go give you a, a quick oversight on the process, the applicant had submitted for a PD rezoning and a concept PD plan previously about almost exactly two years ago. Went through this commission, got a recommendation of approval, went to the Board of County Commissioners, it was ultimately approved. The next step is for the applicant to bring forth a preliminary PD plan plat for each phase, comes before this commission. <clears throat> if approved, they would then submit for their land development permit, which is essentially your construction drawings. Uh, when those drawings are approved, they're allowed to commence construction. The applicant uh, slash developer then has a choice of either developing a minimum of 75% of all of the public improvements and bonding the remaining 25% or they can choose to build 100% of the improvements and seek a certificate of completion. Once one of those two items takes place, then they can go forward with their final plat approval before the Board of County Commissioners. Uh, as I said, this project was granted that approval by uh, the Board in December of 2020. <clears throat> this map shows the site located east of US-1, south of 41st Street, north of 37th Street, and you can see running along the east side is a future road 11th drive that will be constructed connecting 37th with 41st. The county has started the southern portion which would run up to the project's boundary and the applicant would take it from their southern boundary all the way up to 41st Street. Aerial map shows the development embedded within existing development to the east is undeveloped land. Uh, to the south is medical zoning with some medical uses. To the west of this project is an existing single-family subdivision that was built, uh, I believe, back in like the 30s. It was platted in 1926. Uh, to the north is phase one and two of the project, which is going to be single-family housing. This slide shows the preliminary PD plan plat laid out. You can see where the uh, 11th drive is along the east side, and you have 60 lots in this project. They are called paired villas, sometimes referred to as duplexes, so it's all a multifamily in this particular phase. And to the north is their stormwater track. Traffic circulation plan shows a northbound left turn into the project for folks that are coming from 37th Street. Uh, you have t dual access into the project. The road on the bottom ends in a cul-de-sac and there's an internal connection to the north of phases one and two. Stormwater plan, there's gonna be one large pond in the northeast quadrant. Now you can see that this pond is quite large compared to the development. So it's treating not only the runoff from phase three, but it's also going to receive runoff waters from 11th Drive. It's been designed to do so. 
It's going to receive uh, predominantly the southern end of 11 Drive. There are ponds in phases one and two that will receive runoff from the north side. Landscape plan, they will be required to, to provide a 25-foot wide type B buffer along the perimeter of the project. All the property lines that abut property is not owned by them, so they won't put a buffer against their own project to the north, but along the east, south, and west, they're required to put that buffer in. Dedication improvements and conditions. So the applicant is, is required to construct 11th Drive along the entire project, and that is regardless of which phase goes first. Uh, to their west, 17th Avenue and 39th Street, which were previously platted in the subdivision to their west, is what's known as a half street. It only has 25 feet of right of way, so the applicant is required to dedicate the other 25 feet to sort of make the road whole, make a 50 foot right of way. They're also required to construct sidewalks along those two segments of roadway before a CFC would be issued. Uh, the perimeter PD buffers will be required, uh, be reviewed during the LDP process and approved and then constructed. Internal sidewalks along all of the common properties the, the developer is required to. As each uh, paired villa is built, the builder builds the sidewalk along its individual section. They're also required to build a pedestrian system. There's a passive recreation uh, tract in the very southeast corner as a walking path and little sitting benches. Uh, street lighting throughout the, the subdivision will be built and the green space that I mentioned. Uh, with that, we have staff recommendation. Staff recommends that PZC approve the preliminary PD plan plat <coughs> or Harbor Buffs PD phase three with the conditions listed in this staff report. Be happy to answer any questions the commission may have. The applicant is in attendance and is prepared to give their own presentation. Thank you, Patrick. Um, commissioner questions, we'll start on the right, move left, uh, Chip. Um, regarding the concurrency, I mean, assuming 11th Drive is um, assisting in that, but 11th Drive will not be continued to the south. It's not required by them to do so, correct? No, the southern extension of 11th Drive, the county is actually doing that project to connect it to 37th Street. So it's a joint project that's going to be undertaken between the county and the developer to complete the entire 11th Drive between those two roadways. Okay, and that'll be completed at the point in time the COs issued? Before the first CO of the first phase of this development, correct? or any of the phases of the overall Harbor Bluffs PD. You good, Chip? A anyone else on this side? Nope, anyone on this side? Um, go ahead, Alan. <coughs> um, I've always had a problem with this project because I always felt like it's bringing all kinds of traffic into an already heavy traffic area of the hospital and all that whole medical area. Um, but I notice there's nothing in the report about a traffic impact study. Or basically, what is the plan to handle you know, traffic from 487 units, some of which is going to come south right on to 37th Street? Um, how do you envision that traffic being managed so it doesn't become a problem? Sure, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Plagwich, um, So several items. One, a, a traffic impact study was done at the time of the overall, um, and, and our uh, policy or our requirements is that as long as items are not substantially changing, either increasing or distributions are changing, then we don't have them go back through the study, especially within a two-year window. Um, secondly, um, the, the, the 11th drive item was, is intended to be a traffic helper, not generator. Um, it's a, a relief valve for 37th street to allow folks to go north. Um, thirdly, and I, I do want to note that, that that's, well, third thing I would do want to note is there's a, there's turn lanes galore on 11th drive. There's turn lanes at every driveway connection for Harbor Bluffs, of Saxon to the west, these two to the east. There'll be left turn lanes on and right turn lanes on 41st Street at the connection to 11th Drive. And the last thing I'll mention is that this is a, a, a net reduction from what was originally approved back in, in 2020 from 624 down to 487. Um, with all these things being considered, I, I, it's better than what was originally approved. And I, is it going to completely fix 37th Street? I don't think so, but it's, it's our best viable option. Now eventually, 11th Drive is planned to go south of 37th Correct. and around to and connect uh, to uh, US-1, <laughs> yes. correct? I'll, I'll you're, you're speaking my language. <laughs> yeah. Uh, go ahead, finish your question well, and I'll finish. Well, 
and I, I guess that's good and bad. It can relieve tra release. Well, it can relieve the traffic problem, but it may contribute to the traffic problem with cars coming from the south end of the. You're, you're half right, in my opinion. It's good. Phil Matson, uh, Community Development Director, and let me let me uh, articulate what I mean by that. Uh, I think this area, myself personally, I think from a traffic standpoint, I think it's I think it's dead in the water without 11th Drive Aviation Boulevard extension. You've got two major roads, one of which will never be widened. That's US-1. It's got 75 feet of right-of-way. It's already a congestion nightmare. Uh, it's maybe one of two or three places in the entire county that are reminiscent of South Florida <coughs> volume of traffic. That one, there's no cure for it. So when you don't have the opportunity to widen a road, you have to go to the old fallback of densifying your grid. This provides a new grid roadway between the boulevard and US-1. We took the extra unusual step with respect to Aviation Boulevard of modeling uh, with our what we call our travel demand forecast model for Pseudomus, the impacts on all the roads in the area with and without the Aviation Boulevard extension. So this road's going to siphon a lot of traffic off of the boulevard, off of US-1. Cars coming south are going to bite at going down 41st Street and taking 11th Drive to the hospital. Uh, cars coming from the west are going to take Aviation Boulevard all the way up Aviation Boulevard to the hospital. Both of those things take cars off of US-1 and Indian River Boulevard. So whether you're coming from the beach or coming from North and South Vero, uh, I think you'll benefit from this project. So excuse my enthusiasm, I'm, I'm very excited about this element of it and it's a unique, a unique thing about the project. And not an insubstantial amount of traffic, it's something like uh, 2,000 cars a day. So it's, it's measurable, it's a good amount of traffic. And it got to the point through our modeling, we've convinced DOT to take a stake in it. So DOT is gonna be doing the Aviation Boulevard US-1 project now. And one of their options will be a flyover. And that's a bit controversial. I mean, there are people in the area that say, well, a flyover may doom redevelopment someday. Uh, some of these things are monstrous. I don't think it has to be, but the flyover coupled with the Aviation Boulevard project, I think will really ensure smooth sailing in the area from a traffic standpoint for, for a very long time we could pull that off. So uh, I'm pretty excited about it. One last, uh, maybe two last points I'll make on traffic. I could talk about this till everybody's falling asleep, but I see some heavy <laughs> eyelids here. Um, one, if we don't build this project, uh, 11th Drive and Aviation Boulevard, you've really only got two ways in and out of the hospital via 37th. Uh, we had a, cat a catastrophic traffic accident a few years ago that closed the boulevard for something like six hours. I think it was a bicycle, bicycle fatality. So with only one way out, that's why that was closed for six hours. That's why everybody had to loop around. So at least for that day, it really, really made a lot of problems for people seeking medical treatment and traveling around. So this gives you two more entrance ways in an emergency. And then uh, the second thing, unless you start localizing residences to the attractors, in this case, the hospital, you're not gonna get short trips. You're not gonna make a trip that's either a very short car drive or maybe even a, a bicycle ride or, or a walk. So you've kind of got to start somewhere. This is a good opportunity for mixed use development. Okay. The, I'm trying to envision where 11th Drive is going to go once it crosses 37th Street. And I know there's a squiggly little street there, which happens to go past um, primary care of the Treasure Coast where I've been going for years and years. Is that little road going to become 11th Street headed south? Yeah, we bought the old surgical center, which is near that Pentagon-shaped building, because we want to try to take the 11th Drive extension as far away from that Pentagon-shaped building as you can as possible. There, that's a that's a, um, a residential uh, treatment center. So we kind of want to veer away from it a little bit. But by veering away from it, we uh, come up to the natural alignment on 11th Drive on the south side. So Public Works is working on that, and I think they have a very straight shot right across 37th to the, um, to the alignment. So both alignments are gonna move a little bit west. I guess that's the best way to put it. But I think the question was, I mean, that little squiggly road, Hume and Crystal Drive is, it, it's small. Uh, so is that going to be widened as yes. part of the project? Okay. Yes. I don't believe that is Hume and Crystal Drive. I think, I think Hume and Crystal Hume and Crystal's uh, awesome. east of there. And this is the drive that goes uh, where the emergency room entrance is. Yeah, understood. Yep. I may be mistaken. right, but this but is the 11th Drive yeah. uh, extension that's going to ultimately join up and go from a north-south road to an east-west road to Aviation Boulevard. 
I, I seem to think that as that road, if you're traveling on that road with the hospital on your left, coming to the bottom of the attachment anyways, um, it then curves around to the left, to the east. And I'm thinking on that corner, I know the old Vero Orthopedics building used to be there, and I'm thinking there's currently a building now to the west of the, Vero, the old Vero Orthopedics building. You're exactly right, that's a great memory. Um, so Public Works has been in touch with the old Vero Orthopedics building, and I think it's called the Vero Beach Physicians Building, VBPB, um, because they need a corner clip out of the corner of that driveway to connect to I guess the Mallon property, which will take you all the way to aviation, or at least to the Beatty properties to the south. So they'll need one bit of the parking lot from either or both of those uh, buildings, but you're exactly right. So it shouldn't take more than one space from both of those buildings to connect the old 11th drive uh, at its east-west turn to the new aviation boulevard and make for a continuous road. And yeah, the lanes are gonna be wider. It's gonna have a bike lane on it. It, it should be a pretty nice facility. Doesn't the hospital district own that, or did they give that away to the Cleveland Clinic? Yeah, we made a deal with them. We else? were taking over maintenance of 36th Street, which is uh, this direct shot at the very bottom of your screen uh, in exchange for getting that property from them to getting the right of way. So we, we now own it. It's going to be a county road. You own the road, not the building. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, I just not, I will vote in favor of it because this has been approved by the Board of County Commissioners, the overall project. So that issue is an issue that's behind us. So this specific plan on phase three, I don't really have any problems with that. I am just worried overall about the traffic issue. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I you know, it's, we're a growing town. Inevitably, traffic is going to get worse uh, as some of this infill development occurs. The best thing we can do is to try to have some mixed uses to minimize it and to put as many through connections as possible to spread the load out. And I think this project achieves both. Could be worse. On a timing situation, the 11th drive along the, the uh, project will be open, I'm, I'm generally saying, a lot sooner than the extension of 11th drive will be built. South. The north, yes, the north leg will be. Yeah, but they're trying really hard. I mean, that's got to be the county's top priority once all the 43rd and 58th Avenue jobs are done. I mean, that's got to be right up there. We talk about it every day. So it won't, it won't follow in, hopefully, in too, too uh, long order. Mr. Chair, um, at the Board of County Commission meeting on this, this coming Tuesday, the board will award bid for the 11th Drive project. Um, we anticipate starting construction probably the first part of the year after all the bonding and security and, and insurance has been turned over. It's a 270-day project, which will coincide with the construction of this. So the roadway should be finished in, in about the same time as the project is, yeah, but is, is ready. Is that the whole road out to US-1? No, 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 no. That's the east. southern east. leg no. of the north piece. Nope. Yeah. Yeah. To so the US-1 is still at the right-of-way phase, and they're about to, I, if they haven't acquired all the right-of-way, I think they're in the process of it, Bill. It's the, the Beatty and the Mellon project. Right. And we need a pond site somewhere in there, so we're, we're trying to, to organize that. Yeah. But the little stretch through the, um, the old... Uh, Surgical zone. Uh, we called it the Greedy Doctor Surgery Center. Mm -hmm. uh, from this uh, from this project to 37th Street, what's the timing on that? Did, is that That's, what you're I talking about? I don't I don't, I don't call it that because I might need surgery by the end day. of yeah, next so year. I'm a little careful with it. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. I, we're in the process of right away negotiation. I think we have an offer on one of those properties. So. Uh, Oh, you still haven't got the right of way. No, oh, it, it, the, the right of way that we need is to the south. Oh, south. We have of all of the right of way necessary for the 11th Drive project. Right. Yeah, 11th Drive is done. I'm sorry. I thought you were talking done to the south over to the uh, Aviation Boulevard in US 1, which is where the question was posed. Okay. So there's a small piece of right of way we still need uh, to get all the way to US 1. You good, Alan? Is, is that. From 37th South, is that a county project or a DOT yes. project? County project. The intersection will be a DOT project. The county is going to build the first phase, complete the road, and it'll be open as a county project. DOT will be doing an intersection makeover. They don't work 
in, in, in any kind of short time frame. So DOT right now is reaching out to the public and asking what would you like to see at that intersection? Would you like to see an at-grade intersection or some kind of flyover or maybe even an underpass? So DOT has got public hearings they're having now. I'd urge you to attend them. I mean, they're having them all over the city of Vero Beach. Maybe I can reach out to P&Z with uh, information when they have them. Um, I, I think a flyover is a very intriguing prospect. I understand that it, you know, it does create a uh, vertical visual issue, but you got an airport, uh, kind of a tank farm, and a lot of industrial uses in the area, so you're really not interfering with too much from an aesthetic standpoint. And I think the benefits you get of not ever having to wait for a train at at least one east-west roadway or, you know, you can't calculate that. Or the ability to get to the hospital if a train was broken down. That's correct. At Who knows, I might be the first guy on that thing to the hospital, you know. <laughs> it hasn't been said, but I assume there's going to be traffic signals at the 11th Drive, 37th intersection. Yes, that, no. yes, well, that's, yes. yes, it'll be a T intersection signalized. What about 41st Street? Uh, that will not be signalized. Nope. So this project, people heading north have the left and right option. The people on the north side of the street coming out of Lily's K have the same option, but they've got to cross the road to do it. 41st they, Street. They, yes. Yeah, tra traffic signals are put in based on a warrant. So once, if and when the 41st Street traffic volumes ramp up so that you can't get a safe gap in a reasonable amount of time, then you trigger a warrant. And it's all very complicated engineering stuff. It's uh, volumes, uh, peak hour volume, a gap analysis of how big those gaps are, um, speed, travel speed. You know, a lot of stuff goes into the calculation of whether or not a signal is warranted. There's a lot of popular demand to put a signal in. Somebody's gonna get killed, put a signal in. I can't get out of my subdivision. The problem with putting one in that isn't warranted is twofold. One, um, you're putting the engineer at risk who signs off on it. He doesn't have the technical backup to, to justify it. And two, without meeting a warrant, you might be making a problem more, less safe, not more safe, even though you think you're helping. So there's gonna be guys stopping when you wouldn't expect them to stop because of the low volumes of traffic and other guys are gonna plow into the back of them. So you, know, you may be helping the left turn situation, but you're creating more rear ending situations by having that signal in in the first place. So we go very much by the warrant study. It isn't really a question of art. It's more of a science. Well, I mean, I understand what you're talking about, and you're obviously much more qualified as your former position for MBO than I am. But, I mean, common sense, I mean, DOT uses, you have to have a certain amount of deaths at an intersection before they want to do something about it for DOT. And, I, I mean, I have a problem with that personally. But... The property to the east of this, uh, forgive me, I don't remember what is suggested for there. Is that another development as far as residential? Uh, the, the vacant piece the, is the river front, Riverfront Groves piece right now is still med. And okay. All right. I guess we'll see. And philosophically, the time frame, Mr. Matson for DOT and uh, the state for the intersection there on US-1? You're looking 10 years of the intersection. You're looking less than five for the Aviation Boulevard extension, probably more like three or four. And you're looking real short time frame for 11th Drive north of 37th. So it's going to kind of go in, in phases the way most DOT projects, DOT county projects go. Good, Alan? Yes. Mark, anything? Nothing else. Thank you. I'm good, sir. You're good? Uh, okay, we'll go ahead and open for public comment. Anyone who'd like to speak on this, uh, name and address, please. Is it? Yeah. Give me one, yeah, sure. Give me one second here. Um, uh, yeah, you can just use it. I'll just pass it off. Good. Good. Good evening, Chairman, members of the Planning and Zoning Board. For the record, my name is Dan Sorrow with the land planning firm of Cotler and Herring. It's really tough to, uh, to follow Patrick and, and Phil, but uh, I'll try to make some, some comments brief on the, uh, on the presentation. Um, here with me in the council chambers this evening are Mr. Garrett Dinsmore with Pulte Home Corporation and, uh, and Mike Dula, not Jake Lawson, uh, representing uh, the developer and the engineer. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. This is Harbor Bluffs. Uh, project. It's Pulte's newest community uh, in Indian River County, but not their first. 
Uh, Pulte has several uh, projects in Indian River County. You may be familiar with Waterway Village uh, as well as Providence Place. And what's not shown on this map is uh, Harbor Isles, which they're also under construction with uh, uh, currently. So this will, this will be the fourth one uh, that we've done here. Uh, Pulte builds uh, really signature communities. They've got a great housing product. Uh, their amenity centers always include a pool uh, and um, passive rec opportunities as well as uh, a clubhouse. Uh, so, so, so the best of, of current, um, current designs. Uh, we just talked a little bit about the transportation connections. I think Mr. Matson explained very well the extension of Aviation Drive. Uh, but uh, most of the folks coming home or leaving this community uh, have many options. They've got the options of US-1, they've got the options of Old Dixie, as well as 41st Street and 37th. Once 11th Drive is completed, which is required to be completed prior to our first CO. So that road network will be in place, it'll be functioning, and it'll already be uh, able to support the residents and future residents of the site. Uh, this site is directly south of Lily's K, uh, community. Um, so that's been existing for a while. Cleveland Clinic is to the south. And as Mr. Sweeney pointed out earlier, this is the medical district. However, this particular project already went through this board seeking full approval and the Board of County Commissioners seeking approval, changing it from the med uh, to, to uh, what we have today as the Harbor Bluffs PD. We changed that because single family homes are not allowed in the medical district. So that was necessary to get this project approved. It happened uh, a couple years ago. Uh, and as it relates to density, as it relates to traffic, this project is actually helping the surrounding transportation network because we're taking cars off the road. Uh, this project was approved at eight units per acre. And when we came before this board the first time and the county commission afterwards, we said this is gonna help traffic. We're gonna take cars off the road. We're gonna reduce the number of units and that's exactly what this project is doing. Although it's approved for eight units per acre, we're taking it down to 3.37 units per acre, so a significant reduction. Uh, this project is relatively small for Pulte. It's only 60 homes. Uh, so I think that's something everyone can feel good about. And, and why are we asking for a PD? Um, some places call, you, call them PUD in Indian River County. If you have anything that's smaller than a uh, 80 foot lot size, you have to go to a PUD. Uh, so we have a fee simple product that's uh, slightly smaller than that. There's many advantages with a PD. You've got a master stormwater system, which is usually maintained and <clears throat> controlled by the HOA. You've got open space, common rec areas, centralized water and sewer. Uh, so, so a very good zoning tool that we use to get projects approved that your staff is in full support of. This is phase two showing the 60 units of the townhome uh, style, 40% open space. That's 40% of our entire site being green, lush vegetation. It's gonna feel softer. It's, 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 a, uh, it's, a, it's a good improvement to the area. Primary gated access off of the newly constructed 11th Drive that'll be coming. Uh, so only residents will be allowed or visitors that have the residence approval uh, to enter into the site. Uh, our secondary non-gated access, I'll show you a slide in just a second. This is part of a larger project and it connects both the phases, phase one and two and phase three. Rec space at 11.6 per site and we are doing a right of way dedication. Primary gated access, secondary. Uh, you can see the uh, each PD before it comes in, it's required to do a seven and a half percent open space requirement. That's part of your code. Uh, the green areas, as Mr. Murphy was indicating earlier, uh, do designate those common areas within the community that have the walking trails and the benches uh, and the areas to, um, to just, you know, fellowship uh, out uh, within the community outside the houses. The shared amenity center uh, is going to be provided for phase one and two and three. Uh, so anyone within this entire Harbor Bluffs community is gonna have access to that uh, amenity center. You see phase one and phase two. Phase one and two are all single family homes. Phase three are what we call twin villas. It's an attached home. Uh, what we have a lot of times is some of our friends uh, from up north that are seasonal residents. They want small, but just because it's small, it doesn't mean it can't be nice. 
so they'll buy a second home or a vacation home. Uh, that's typically what we find in our villa products, uh, whereas you get some more families living in the single family section just to the north. This shows phase two in context with the uh, single family that this board had already approved. We're hoping to get land development permit very shortly and get the top portion under construction. Uh, and then you know, after this step tonight, uh, we'll follow up with a land development uh, permit and, uh, and get the villa section approved also. Uh, we do have a lot of different options when any of our customers are picking out a new house. They've got colors, they've <coughs> got finishes, they've got tile materials and even pavers all to help them distinguish one from another. We do have an anti-monotony plan also so that no two houses can look the same next to each other. We wanted to pro provide some diversity and variety among the streetscape. So this just kind of shows uh, what the offerings are. Uh, this is an example of one of the elevations. It's called the pearl gray color. There's a whole package that comes uh, with, uh, with any of these options as well as the, uh, the knitting needles. Uh, so those are all two car garages and they range in square footages from I think 1800 to around uh, 27, 2800 square feet. A couple other options. Um, as your staff mentioned earlier, this PD is consistent with your land development code. They are recommending approval. We would ask for your favorable support tonight and uh, be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Any commissioner questions? I believe on your first slide, or one of your first slides, you identified Old Dixie Highway and not US-1. It looked more like uh, US-1 to me, but for what it's worth. <laughs> Just one last question. I noticed your slide about the pool had a young couple with young kids. I assume this is not intended to be a 55 and over community. Is that correct? It's not being age restricted, no, sir. Although they're more than welcome to buy a home here. Yeah, yeah. You, got, you got a chance. Very good. Thank you. All right, any additional questions? I have a comment. All right. Uh, to staff. Um, this project has taken away a lot of m medical zone previously medical zone property in that area. Um, having been involved with the hospital for 27 years uh, as either an attorney or a member of the board of directors, um, I, I've witnessed the, and you've witnessed too, the extensive growth of medical facility, of medical buildings and facilities. 11th Drive is going to become a place where medical offices will want to locate because it's a direct shot right up to the hospital. Uh, I'm assuming there's no medical zoning right now you know, along the area that 11th Drive is gonna take, but you may think about that because I'm sure in the future as we've taken away this medical zoning, there may be requests for medical facilities along 11th Drive. <laughs> Almost lost it there. Uh, I don't know if I'll actually have it on a, perhaps the zoning map, well, um, the, so again, the riverfront parcel that I referenced, which is just uh, probably about 35 acres, it would be 40 minus the clip from the boulevard, that's all still zone med. There's quite a bit of med uh, east of this, of Harbor Bluffs. So there, uh, yes, so one of the very first questions from staff to these folks, well, Hugh Russell, who was the original owner, and um, we said, hey, this is an awful lot of medical zoning that you're going to be taking out of play, or, you know, is this something that you've considered and I think we still have a decent balance. I, I think a lot of the hospital centric uh, or oriented stuff will still occur on the hospital campus. Um, but yeah, there, there's still a pretty good bit of med, med zoning out there uh, in that. In that. Take some away up around the corner of 41st. Yes, the Schwerin, the Schwerin piece, it was, a, it was a small bit and it was a swap. Um, but yes, you, that, you, you remember, yeah, and I believe it changed the CL. Yes. I just, I, I can see it up ahead. 11th Drive doctors are going to want offices or other medical uh, personnel will want offices on 11th Drive. So you might just think about. Right. And, and actually, um, <clears throat> I mean, your, your point's well taken, Alan, because we also, I mean, the, 
the, the what used to be the the um, Bureau of Orthopedics, which was in the positions the VBPB is now, you can actually see under construction they built fronting the boulevard, not on 11th Drive, but yeah, there's still a, a, quite a bit of med. This could be a whole medical complex, quite frankly, and um, the the Saxon Harbor Bluffs, which is really truly Phase One east of 11th Drive, is also fully approved and is geared towards studio and one bedroom apartments, which is would like to cater to nurses and, and other hospital workers as well. Anything else? Call for a motion. Motion to approve. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Uh, we have a motion to approve a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Good enough. Good enough. Yep. Okay. Our um, third quasi-judicial uh, item tonight is uh, an FPNL uh, Turnpike Solar Energy Center. And this is a request for major site plan approval for a solar facility. Florida Power and Light is the owner. Um, Lucido and Associates are the agent. This is located south of the intersection of 17th Street Southwest and 162nd Avenue Southwest. The zoning is Agricultural 2, up to one unit per 10 acres. Land use designation is Agricultural 2, um, Agricultural 2 units per 10 acres. Um, and uh, any ex parte <coughs> declarations? No. Um, staff presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Patrick Murphy, Senior Planner, will uh, present this item as well. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, yes, as you stated, uh, Mr. Chairman, this is the Turnpike Solar Energy Center. It is a major site plan. Uh, the first slide I wanted to direct you to was sort of an overall slide showing you some of the other solar farms that have already been approved and under construction. If you look to the, um, the upper right of this project, the FPNL Indian River was the first solar farm that was approved and constructed in and near River County. Uh, that was followed by uh, Blue Cypress, which is up and running as well. Um, and then Orange Blossom followed as a third one. Those all three are completely generating electricity now. They're completed. The fourth was FPNL Grove on the far west side of the slide. That is, um, I believe construction has completed and most of those panels are electrified. Uh, to the very southwest is this particular phase. This is going to be the fifth solar farm, FPNL Turnpike. It is located very far west of the interstate and pretty far south of State Road 60. On the location map, you can see where the property sits, basically at the southern end of the T intersection of 17th Street and 167 Avenue. It is just north of the Turnpike and the border with St. Lucie County. Uh, the property is zoned A2, and all the properties surrounding are also zoned A2 agricultural. <clears throat> Aerial map shows the, the site located in what was former citrus groves. They have not been uh, yielding any citrus for many years, and FBL purchased the property to um, build this, this fifth solar farm. Overall site plan shows the solar panel arrays sitting on the site with service paths running east and west and the main uh, access roads running north and south. In the very northwest corner, you'll see sort of a blue arc. <clears throat> that is the 985-foot buffer zone for Crested Caracara. That is located off-site of this, but they are required to buffer it, so you'll see no development, solar arrays, or otherwise in that area. The extended grid note, <clears throat> let's try that again. The extended grid network, uh, this is a county ordinance that requires uh, developers to set aside their projects for if and when the county ever extends these roadways. So right now, 21st Street Southwest and 162nd Avenue would run through the project in the future if the county was to extend those. So per this ordinance, the developer is required to site their panels and their driveways outside of where that road alignment would go so that it would not obstruct it if and when in the future we built that. Uh, brings me to staff recommendation. Uh, staff recommends that PZZ grant major site plan approval for the proposed FPNL Turnpike Solar Energy Center with the conditions stated in the staff report related to uh, they need to obtain their environmental agency permits and they need to um, construct their construction hall route for this project. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions the commission may have. The applicant is in attendance and does intend to uh, provide a short presentation as well. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Uh, commissioner, questions? 
Go ahead. Um, there's a Cara Cara bird mm -hmm. off site but nearby creating a 985 foot buffer. Correct. Okay, let's imagine five years from now the Cara Cara bird dies or moves away. Um, does that buffer go away or do they have to come back and get a site plan modification to eliminate the buffer? And if they have to come back and get a site plan modification, is there any way we can make their path easier today by saying something like, there's a condition of that buffer as long as, and staff can, can, has the authority to uh, eliminate the buffer requirement any time the nest, at such time as the nest becomes vacant and no longer used? Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Prokowicz. Um, now that solar fields or solar facilities are a permitted use within the zoning district, um, I would, I, staff would be able to amend that at, at a staff level through what we call an administrative uh, approval. Um, if, if it were still a special exception or even administrative permit use like it was before, we would have to come back to you all. But the, 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 the only reason we're here tonight is because of the site plan threshold. Um, so. Mr. Chairman. Patrick, could you go to your first slide, please? Certainly. Okay, which way is north? North is to the top of the screen. <laughs> wow. Okay. It's a good distance out there. It sure is. It, it, yeah, 95 barely even shows up on the side. That's how far. <laughs> okay, west. thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay, so I don't think any of the FPNL contingent was sworn in. So if you're going to speak, would you have the recording secretary swear you in, please, and then have at it? You swear for him to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Okay, good. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Matt Silver with Florida Power and Light. I am a project director of development for this project. Um, before I get started, um, I just want to thank staff. Um, Patrick and Ryan did a fantastic job summarizing it, and I think my slides are going to duplicate a lot of what they just showed, so I'll try not to, uh, uh, to waste any of y'all's time tonight. So real quick, we're proud of this project. Um, it is kind of out in the, at the edge of civilization, I guess you could say it. Um, as it was pointed out, um, it's called Turnpike Solar because really the only thing near it is the Florida Turnpike. Um, if you want to go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, Oh, you leave that. That wasn't the Cara Cara no. bird sitting on the... Uh, yeah. No, that is, that is, I think that's a hawk there. The Cara Cara's got a... No, that's a Cara Cara. Cara. Okay. That's a... It looks like an osprey. That's yeah. an osprey. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. I'll, I'll try to get a picture for the next time we come. <laughs> so, and by the way, I did appreciate your comment about the Cara Cara. Um, I, it's a long process to get that taken off the map. The uh, I think it's uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife. So, but I appreciate the, <laughs> the comment. Uh, so FBL is proud to serve about 86,000 homes in the county. The four projects that were mentioned earlier, I won't read them off to you since we just went over that. Uh, they provide enough mm -hmm. energy for about 60,000 homes. This one will push it to about 75,000. So we're getting really close to where, um, you know, you could say like the entire load, of, at least residential load for the county is powered by solar within it, um, any river county itself. And uh, we're, we're not going to stop. Um, working with staff has been terrific. Uh, the text amendment that was referenced earlier, um, you know, just shows like, you know, what great partners. Indian River County is with working with us and I've done development all over the state and I can promise you that that's not something we assume or take take for granted um, you know not everybody's uh, pleasant to work with and uh, lastly we also always like to share you know we pay about six thousand or we contribute about six million dollars to the tax roll last year and as we build more of these solar energy centers it's certainly a big step up from the previous ag use um, you want to proceed to the next so Really, uh, a lot of ways these things sell themselves when you're talking to the neighbors. Um, our neighbors for this project are all just either cattle pasture or maybe former citrus grove and then the turnpike uh, and the county line to the south. Um, but they're quiet, they're clean, there's no emissions, there's no t uh, any kind of pollution to the water source out there. We don't consume any water, um, which makes uh, our friends at the SGID really happy. Um, and then there's no lights, they sit low to the ground, you can't see them. And obviously with this one out here, there's not really any neighbors to complain about seeing it anyways. And of course, the con contributions to the taxes. Go ahead. 
So this is a little bit closer up. You can see the existing Grove Solar Energy Center across the street. Um, this project won't require any new transmission lines. That's a common question we get when we build new solar sites. This will use all the existing transmission and collector yard infrastructure uh, that was constructed at Grove. So it will strictly be solar panels and inverters and the solar uh, infrastructure. Project's about 565 acres. And we've actually already uh, received approval from the FDEP for our environmental resource permit and for what's called a 404 general permit. And those were required, one, for the environmental and stormwater review, and two, for is essentially there's some culvert crossings we had to expand, which impact waters, which then eventually connect to things. There's no wetland impacts. There's no species impacts, as we previously talked about. And then the SJID, as of today, issued their permit as well. <coughs> and staff has already started their review of the stormwater, so we're confident that um, really we're just seeking y'all's approval here tonight, and we're excited to start construction. It says April here of tw uh, 2023. Um, we possibly could pull that in a couple months too once we get all the approvals. And then in-service date would be January of 2024. And that really sums up all my slides. We're happy to take any questions. And thank you all again for your time. Thank you. Questions? Mark? Just just out of curiosity, uh, do you have any other counties with as much solar development as, as you have here? So DeSoto County kind of started our solar development process. We had property there going back to the 60s. So it's essentially kind of free for us to start working on. It has four, we'll say like four and a half solar sites. The first one that was built was a little smaller. So this one will bring you ahead of uh, DeSoto. I think you guys in St. Lucie and Hendry are probably leading the way in the state. You all hit f 1 million panels before St. Lucie, if anybody's keeping score. <laughs> I think Thank we've you. already done the $1 million. We, we usually, when we hit a million, we do like a big celebration here with the boards. And that's a credit, again, to you, know, you all being great partners. How did your panels fare in Hurricane Ian, that the eye of which passed right over my house? Believe me, uh, we, we were all interested to see how it was, and it was, uh, I think it was like 0.03% of panels were damaged in the storm, um, and they were primarily focused over on the West Coast. Everything over here was up and running the next day, and oftentimes after the storm, it's not even like, the panels aren't like blowing away or becoming like a, a hazard. It's usually you go out there and you find something went through the panel, and a comedian once said, it's not that the wind is blowing, it's what the wind is blowing, and you know, there's only so much you can do with that. But, you know, we were really proud with how well they performed during it. I was actually the operations manager when Irma blew over the panels, and that was a long night of me watching the site to see how it's doing. Yeah. <laughs> Remotely, I was not there. But. Any other questions? Yep, go ahead. Yes, go. I have one. All of your projects are 74.5 megawatts, million watts? Yep. Megawatts. And that's because if you go above 75 megawatts, you have to go to the, the... It's a permitting threshold, kind of like what the earlier folks were talking about. Um, one of the advantages of this is it does keep it in, like, the county review hands without getting the state involved. And so we you still maintain, like, the efficiencies of scale. That you'd have to go to Public Service Commission if you'd go above 75? It's, it's not Public Service Commission. It's something okay. called the Power Plant Siting Act. Um, and typically Ugh. the DEP governs that. Yeah. But the other advantage, honestly, to doing something in, in this uh, kind of scale, if you will, we don't want to put all of our solar in one specific spot because, let's face it, in Florida, you're going to have a storm blow through. You would have all your generation dip all at the same time. So by keeping it kind of spread out like we have, not just within Indian River but across the state, this kind of smooths out like the, you know, the fronts as they blow through Florida, which isn't something you would think about until you start putting a lot of these on the grid, but it really does help. And I, I, I'm just <laughs> thinking that, you know, who's going to say no if you go to 100 megawatts or something like that to, to make it easier for you? Uh, I mean, I, I don't know if your lobbying folks are, are looking at something like that or, or if it doesn't fit in with your scale. Yeah, I mean, we're certainly always willing to have conversations. Um, you know, we found that, you know, partnering with the local communities, you know, that you know, it, it's important that you have the local communities buy in, you know, to go to the state and try to have it push from the top down. That, that can be counter counterproductive in a lot of ways. And, again, finding, you know, places like Indian River and your neighbor, I'm not trying to, you know, cast any you know, shade on your neighbors as well, but, you know, having communities that support it, you know, that, that goes a long way. And we live and work in these communities, so. 
So below 75 is, is on the county level, above 75 is state. It, it's coordinated through the DEP. It's not that the it takes Florida entirely, yeah, yeah, Florida yeah. DEP. it doesn't take it entirely out of the, you know, the local government's hands, but additional layer. it's, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, we're not complaining. <laughs> uh, anything else? Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, if there are no additional comments or questions, I'll call for a motion. Motion to approve. Motion to approve. Okay, move to approve. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Good enough. Closing in on the end here. Um, the final um, agenda item is a public hearing. Um, and that is consideration of staff initiated land development regulation amendment to section 930.072 um, I to allow for um, exceptions to the cut and fill balance requirements for commercial and industrial uh, developments in flood hazard areas. Um, this is a, um, a public hearing. Uh, any declarations of Ex parte communication, uh, none. Um, everyone's been sworn in, so um, staff presentation, please. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members Hello. of the commission, Rebecca Guerra, Chief Code Enforcement and Environmental Planning. So tonight, as you stated, we have an LDR amendment to allow for exceptions to the cut and fill balance requirements for commercial industrial de developments in flood hazard areas. That's a mouthful, like that's a lot. Let me break it down for you initially so we can have a better understanding of what we're dealing with before we get into the meat of what the amendment is. So it's a special flood hazard area. SFHAs are land areas designated by FEMA that are at high risk for flooding. That's all that they are. And they're otherwise known as floodplains. And so here we have a nice little graphic that shows you exactly what a floodplain would be. So it gives you a better understanding of the area, this very specific area that we're dealing with tonight for this particular um, LDR amendment. So what's cut and fill? It's also known as compensatory storage. And so cut and fill is required when there's a reduction in the existing available floodplain, so in that general overall area that we showed in that graphic previously, in that available floodplain storage, because there's a, a portion of that floodplain is either filled, it's occupied by a structure, or when a project or development changes the channel hydraulics, and that's it. That's all that that means. And here's a really good graphic that shows you basically where it's cut out, where it's fill in, and where if the cut is equal to the fill, then that delta is that requirement that's needed to be provided. That's basically in a nutshell what this LDR is dealing with. So now let's get into it. So since 1978, the county's participated in FEMA's National Flood Insurance Program. So under the NFIP, flood insurance rates are discounted based on how the county adopts and implements uh, flood protection standards and regulations, right? Uh, one of those regulations deals with those special flood hazard areas, including the cut and fill balance requirements. So since 1982, the county has required a cut and fill balance for all developments within those special uh, flood hazard areas. In 2017, uh, staff was contacted by a commercial property owner to allow the filling of a pond on site without providing for that cut and fill or that compensatory storage. So the property owner was particularly concerned that a cut and fill balance requirement made small scale commercial and industrial development difficult. His site in particular was under five acres. So he said, look, it's going to cost me way too much for me to meet this requirement to meet this overall standard that you've set in order for us to maintain our number under that flood, right, under that, uh, that, under that flood protection that the county was involved in through FEMA. So staff researched the feasibility of establishing a waiver to the cut and fill balance requirements. We did our research, and what we did was that we added four requirements for a, for a waiver to be granted. Those four requirements narrow the list of eligible properties and better aligns the waiver, so these four waivers or these four criteria that we're establishing, to properties that would really particularly benefit from that change. And so it allows for those smaller and commercial industrial pieces, and we are talking about only commercial and industrial pieces to be able to be developed, and 
It also avoids for offsite impacts to developments that are adjacent to this particular property. Existing provisions, though, that are already in the code offer additional protection. So one of those examples are uh, uh, not allowing waivers to be granted or for structures or fulfill within the floodways of the site of the St. Sebastian River. So if, if there are any other tenants within the code that would offer additional protection, this does not do away with those and it doesn't impact those. On August the 16th of this year, staff conceptual, or not staff, the BCC conceptually approved the LDR amendment that I'm gonna to propose to you tonight. So because this is an LDR amendment process, as you know, this is legislative in nature, and the process that we are gonna follow is that this commission needs to recommend or should recommend uh, uh, approval moving forward to the BCC for their ultimate approval. So the ordinance will specifically amend section 93007 subsection two subsection I. And those four requirements for a waiver to be granted must all be fulfilled. It's not an either or, all four must be granted. First, the development site must be under five, si five acres in size. Secondly, the, a formal site plan is required for waiver consideration. Third, a formal engineering analysis by a licensed prof professional engineer is required, proving that there's no on-site or off-site drainage impacts. And that analysis has to be recorded into the public record. And lastly, the development site must be within a commercial or an industrial zoning district at the time that the waiver is adopted. So those are four very strict requirements. And what they do is that it severely limits the number of parcels that will be affected, but it allows those parcels that are smaller to go ahead and develop in a way that they couldn't before without hurting the county's overall, right, offsite or floodplain mitigation strategies. Staff's recommendation is for this commission to recommend that the Board of County Commissioners <clears throat> adopt the proposed LDR subsection 93007-2I amendment ordinance. This concludes my presentation. I'm available for any questions you may have. Thank you, uh, Rebecca. Nice job on explaining a complicated uh, issue. Nice. Um, commissioners, questions? Yes, I have. Rebecca, can you go back to the slide that has the St. Sebastian River reference? Yes, oh, ma'am. Right there. Um, are there any other areas in the county that, that would be similar to the floodway of the St. Sebastian yes, River? Yes, ma'am. I can't name them off of my head, but any other protected area which would have additional requirements or restrictions would not be affected and they couldn't apply this waiver to those areas. Okay. All right. That, that's my question. It, nice. Uh, Chip? Uh, I realize that um, Mr. Popple is, uh, was a force behind this. Are there other entities that this applies to? It would apply to a myriad of other properties within the county. Um, we did a research of uh, properties around the county that were under five acres in size. So the total, let me show you the map first. So we looked at the entire county. We looked at parcels. I'm sorry? North is to the left. Just so. Sorry. North is this way. Um, look, I had to fit it on the screen. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so we looked at the entire county. We looked at parcels that were under five acres in size and that were already zoned commercial and industrial at the time that this would be adopted. So any, any rezonings, we took that into account. We also took out any county-owned parcels. Um, now, I will caveat this by saying that the number I'm gonna show you now um, is a very conservative number. It includes properties which are undeveloped. It includes properties which are landlocked and are unlikely to be developed. But this gives you the overall number. The total parcels that we pulled were 258, and the total acreage is 212 acres. Again, that number is far larger than the actual number but I would remiss, be remiss to, to not show you the map. Um, that, that number is probably very significantly smaller, probably into the um, hundreds of acres and in the hundreds of properties. Okay. Have there been Could, other applicants or entities that have approached you regarding this? 
some folks have expressed some interest in it, um, but this resurfaced again, as you said, with this particular property owner, um, which wanted to go ahead and develop the site. And so because it was something that we examined in 2017, um, we brought it forward. We re-examined it. We took a fresh look at the LDR changes that were being proposed. We ran this through Public Works, as I said. Um, it went before the county commission. They looked at the proposed amendment that you're seeing today and indicated that we should move forward with those proposed changes. And I believe we have our director here ready yeah. to comment. Yeah, I'm, I'm loath to say anything because, you know, Rebecca's doing such a good job with this. But a couple of things. Um, we see this. We went through a visioning process, and we want to maintain – obviously our resiliency and our environmental integrity and so forth, but we also want to spur economic development. So for somebody who wants to bring an industrial business in on a very small five acre or less site, this takes an onerous burden away from them that really has what we call a de minimis impact on overall flooding, yeah, or almost none. It's like a, your, your setbacks are 10 feet and the guy's 9.99 feet, you let him have it. Um, the, Acreage thing, though, that was a little confusing on the last slide. So it's 200 acres. That's the total cumulative, cumulative right? I mean, you really can only <laughs> can only displace a hole of 500 cubic yards per acre. And I asked the engineers because I'm not really smart enough to envision 500 cubic yards. I'm picturing like one of these, you know, a bunch of them. He said, picture a couple of large swimming pools. So you're really only having the same impact as a couple of large swimming pools on a five-acre site. Uh, if you want to think about what the net displacement is. So. Another question. Quite far away. Um, if, if we make this change, um, will this affect the discounted rates that we're receiving from FEMA? They will not. I have a slide for that. The community rating system, which I believe um, Commissioner Mitchell is referring to, is a, vol is a voluntary incentive program um, that addresses that floodplain management practices. The county currently has a five CRS rating score, which is an improvement over the six that it had in 2017. A five score uh, translates to 25% reduction in the insurance, and based on the um, discussions with CRS administrative staff, this proposed waiver would not negatively impact that number. But I did the graph. I have all the information presented here for you. Jordan, go ahead. Oh no, I was just okay. a thumbs up. I got a thumbs up. Yeah. <laughs> well, you got to use. You can't do a high five, can you? I do have a question. Oh, yep. um, Chip, go yeah, ahead. I realize it's not sp strictly for this, but it does. It is mentioned in this about the one acre parcels uh, that were split prior to 1990, and I know there's been some discussion uh, potentially about another one-time split. And so would that create quite a few more properties? I, you know, and I know it's theoretical, but. Uh, okay, so if you've exempted your one-time split, you can't split the property again. The smallest you could split a property to is what your underlying zoning is. Uh, interesting question. I don't think we analyzed, so of the 212 acres of properties that are eligible for this now, how many of them can be split again under the new one-time split ordinance? I would say probably less than 50%. I would agree with that number. Um, so I would say, Chip, that might move it up to 300 potential acres. That's a fairly small amount of acreage in the gamut of all the counties, you know, 524 square miles. But keep in mind, that's the acreage of the underlying property, not how much can be displaced. You're only looking at 500 cubic yards per acre. So it's a small piece of a smaller lot. Okay. Any questions on this side? Yes, I, I have a, I'm not sure whether this applies or not, but I remember what was, I think, my first meeting uh, a little over a year ago, and we were looking at a church, I believe, and it, was some, it had this huge retention pond because it you couldn't import fill. And I don't know whether that had to do with cotton fill. I never did understand why that was, but uh, is this at all related? And is there a simple explanation to why you have to dig a huge pond because you can't bring any fill in? I can try. I, I'll attempt. Uh, yeah. uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Mutcher, uh, yes, the, yes, that's precisely it. The, the cut and fill is is exactly what we're talking about. Is basically you have to have a net zero. You you can't bring fill in. You can't export it. Um, 
a lot of the residential developments that we see with those giant ponds is because of the cut and fill requirement. So in this case, on a commercial site, a very, very small subset of the overall area of the county would be exempted uh, from that requirement. Is that only in certain areas or Correct. countywide? It's, it, well, it's ca so it's countywide, but it has to be commercial industrial zoning. So that's maybe 5% of the total properties of the county, probably lower than that. And then in addition to that, it has to be in the floodplain. So that's why we arrive at uh, only the few hundred acres total. And it has to be under five acres. It's, it, it's less than, it's probably less than one, it's 0.1% of, of the total county that would be affected. And again, I can't state enough, that number, the 200 number, is a very conservative number. I'd, I'd, I'd venture to say, I'd be comfortable to say at least between an, a an eighth and a quarter of it would be undevelopable, given the fact that many of them are landlocked or many of them are simply undevelopable. Thank you. Okay, this is a public yep. nope. hearing. I've got another uh, a question or two. Um, as far as the pond that started this whole thing going. Did that site have an existing industrial use on it? Yes. Okay, and then that pond was filled in, is that correct? Yes. So the owner violated existing code by not providing for the cut and fill balance. Basically, he filled in the pond eliminating that is is that the case the, kind of um, yeah I, I'm not exactly sure how that particular violation and what was noted was resolved I know it was resolved I know there were some fines involved and I know there was a replatting and a resite plan but I think more importantly that owner was pretty adamant you know he's a, he's a well-known economic development figure in saying hey in the future a uh, small businessman or a small industry like myself should be able to dig a small hole or fill a small hole as part of our business model and plan and not, you know, have to go through a complicated uh, permitting process or, you know, my impact's minimal. Can't you analyze this and see what would be de minimis? And I had a conversation with some of the engineers and I'm like, you know, like, well, first they're like, uh, I don't know. So I'm like, so, okay, so if you, if you dig half your property up, I mean, are you going to be impacting drainage anyway? Yeah, of course it is. Well, what if you take a teaspoon and move a teaspoon of dirt around? Are you gonna be impacting the drainage? No. Somewhere in between those extremes is a level we could both and all concur on is a de minimis amount of dirt that could be moved that should be exempt from the permitting processes and the normal, uh, I guess, DEP process if we could exempt it at our level from it or whatever. And we came upon this 500 cubic yard amount. So this was satisfactory to the uh, individual who wanted to advocate for, I guess, a de minimis standard to assist other small businesses in the same situation, and, you know, we're amenable to it. it is, as far as the commandment where thou shalt not flood thy neighbor, I mean, it, 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 are, yeah, are we changing? Be, Phil, Phil, and let me be it for no, no, 500 me cubic yards shall not fund a neighbor. Let, let me 500 finish. 501 will. Thank you. Um, is it going to change the size of the drainage pond, of the stormwater pond? Or is a stormwater pond on a floodplain gonna be the, now the same size as it would be on a non-floodplain site for uh, industrial commercial development? Uh, again, I think, Bill, and uh, you know, it'd probably be great to have, if, you, if we ever needed clarification from Public Works, but they're very strict about this in our county. Um, I think they thought that this <clears throat> uh, LDR, the way it was crafted at this amount, would be just the ideal amount that would have no impact on having to resize a pond in either direction. So, Ryan, I mean, is that your understanding as well? well I think to answer Bill's question differently is is it, the the difference between the size of a pond with a cut and fill versus the, the, the without is only the only difference is the 500 cubic yards. Right. So they're getting only the smallest amount of leeway, if you will. Does that answer your question? Yes, that answers my question. Thank you. Um, and now I know we just spent a considerable amount of time and effort in our new floodplain measurements that, that went through and we got a lower rating. Yes. Now, 
one of those requirements, I believe, is did you pass any new ordinances that would affect the floodplain amount? Is that one of the considerations that's used in evaluating our flood rating? Yeah, Whether we've was, changed anything in our code. This, this did not have any impact on our rating. Is that one of the factors that they look at to try and determine whether or not the floodplain rating should change? Did you pass any ordinances that would affect, affect floodplain rating? Yes, check. No, check. Whatever it is. Yes. Okay. And, and when we check with them with this proposed amendment, they, it, as I indicated in my slide, they in fact indicated to us that the proposed amendment that we were bringing forward would not affect our current rating. And each rating point, I think, is pretty substantial. It's something like 15% off flood insurance, you know, community-wide. So uh, I think the budget people in the county are pretty adamant that we don't, um, sorry, 25% reduction five, in insurance five premiums per, mm -hmm. per score. at 5%, at, at a score of a 5 so they were pretty adamant that we don't take any measure, pass anything that will jeopardize that. And I could also say that at five, we're among the we're among the better counties here in, in the in the state in this regard. We just I'm not saying we're that great here, but we just happen to happen on two things that we're really good at here in this county tonight. One is solar energy, and the other is a CRS flood rating system. So, and we and we're we're run by B counters. I mean, this county always has been. They're very bottom line oriented. And this was emphasized, I can tell you, in the crafting of this LDR. So if I come in with a 4.5 acre site and I have to come in with a site plan, and if I get site plan approval, then I can go ahead and start. Yes. But I have to have the site plan before I do my site work. Correct. Right. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So just out of curiosity, when, were there any substantial uh, improvements that made when we moved from a um, a six to a five back in, I guess, 2017 or 2016, 2017, we secured the more favorable. Plan. Yeah, you know, really the guy who gets most of the credit for it is Andy and Rich Spurka from uh, Public Works and his drainage engineers. But uh, it wasn't that we took a lot of different policy measures. It's that we did things that were fairly easy to do, that we got into a lot of training routines that we didn't have normally. We did inventorying and took credit for existing flood retention facilities we didn't have that we didn't report before. Um, there's a whole series of strategies. It's, it's, um, it's 20 or 30 odd strategies in different categories, everything from education to uh, policy to actual having facilities like our, you know, Moorhead Marsh that we're building and things like this. So they, I know they just kind of did their homework and doubled down more than make a lot of strategic policy changes. But some of the policy changes we made, too, in, you know, in, in, in Public Works' floodplain analysis did help. Thank you. Helen? Um, <clears throat> in the language of the ordinance itself, uh, the amendment, um, first of all, it's entitled Commercial and Industrial Development Located Within a Commercial Industrial Node. Mm -hmm. um, and then down below, one of the conditions is the site be located in a commercial industrial zoning district. Mm -hmm. My understanding of a node, and I may be wrong, I don't know, but for example, you'd see a commercial node around a, an intersection on a, a well-traveled road. Um, why, is it, why is it stated in terms of nodes as opposed to just commercial industrial I think they just, that's just a nomenclature, that's just a, a nomenclature that they chose for the beginning right, for the preface part of the actual waiver. The physical part of the waiver, the four requirements, specifically mandates a zoning district. Okay. Yep. So they're talking about more like, instead of using air, the word area, they use the word <clears throat> nodes, they use cluster. Generally speaking in this county, commercial industrial area nodes are clusters or areas that are grouped together. And so they don't, in very certain parts of the county, they're scattered. But you have industrial and commercial nodes along US-1. You have them centered around 20. They're just nodes. They're areas. They're clustered areas. Kind of but here, the waiver has to be for the zoning district. Nodes are relatively small, aren't they? No, uh, no, no. The, in fact, the one would, uh, not to pick on a specific site, but like, for example, the, the 98th Avenue, State Road 60 98th Avenue industrial node is, is very much linear and not a node. But yes, in other cases, like, uh, Oslo Road and 27th Ave, it, it's 
almost a, a perfect circle around the intersection. Is the word in our land development regulations, we have that definition section that goes on for pages and pages. Is the word node defined in there? That The CI node is actually probably more, more, uh, uh, more applicable to the future land use designation. So at, at the comp plan level, um, yeah. that's where you designate the CI land use, and then within the CI land use is the commercial and industrial zoning districts. Okay. So. Well, and the only thing I'm trying to avoid is, a, is two different concepts yep. here being used maybe without intention. Sure. Yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. Node has a specific definition, mm -hmm. and we use nodes. Uh, give you an idea, the best way that I'm aware of that we use the nodes, uh, we have a commercial industrial node at major intersections, but they're pretty large. I mean, they'll, they'll be a mile in each direction from the intersection. Somebody will come along to us and say, hey, I want to rezone some property and turn it from ag, whatever its underlying zoning was, into commercial, which we're allowed to do. We won't allow it if there's already vacant commercial property to a certain extent in that four square mile node. So the node has a specific legal definition and applicability in this case. The node doesn't have that same applicability here. I think she's just saying it means the general area. Okay. And I guess the only reason I'm pointing it out is just to make sure we don't pass or approve something that <clears throat> has two different meanings there that would create an ambiguity in the future. Yes, sir. And the last so could, the, could the way that it's, this is written be solved by just removing node? We could change that to land use designation just to be clear. So we don't want to we don't want to preempt a, a, a property that's outside of a specific node if it if it does have a CI land use designation. Yeah. We can just change the word to areas. Nine, 901, 901 does not define commercial industrial node, and node is also not defined. Right. So we can just instead of nodes, we can use areas. Commercial industrial areas. zoning district or something. Okay. And the only other thing I'd, I'd ask, uh, the next sentence, or the first sentence, substantive sentence, uh, in the public interest promoting economic development. Okay, I understand that. But then the next one says, and in recognition of the limited impacts of commercial industrial development to base flight elevations within these nodes. I mean, is there some, are we trying to say that the, the impacts from commercial industrial development with respect to base flood elevations are less than, for example, in a residential zoned area <clears throat> or an agricultural zoned area? Does someone down the road come in and say, hey, my impacts are no, our commercial industrial impact uh, development impacts are greater than mine, so I should also be able to get a waiver, you know, let's amend it to but give me a waiver because I have a less yeah, Mr. So Blackwoods is an excellent point, and I don't know what we're trying to say. I hmm. think what we're trying to say here is we have a fairly small amount of commercial and industrial property relative to all the uh, land use categories in the county. You know, we're not we're not Detroit here, so I think we think we're indicating that even if a lot of those properties were to bite at a de minimis exception, it still wouldn't amount to much in the overall scheme of things. There's a lot better ways we could say that. So. Let's, let, let me toy with a little language right here. And in maybe something like, and in recognition of the, let's see, limited availability of commercial industrial parcels in the county's land use inventory, something like that. I'll leave you to wordsmith it, but to me there's a sentence, that, that phrase could create a problem down the road. Yeah, it, it, you, you can interpret <coughs> is commercial industrial has less of an impact than does, you know, farming, which wouldn't be the case. Yeah. I know what you mean. So those two sentences will be cleaned up. Yes, sir. Yeah. And so j just to be clear, so if I have a five-acre site, I can do 500, acre, 500 yeah. cubic yards per acre for a total of 2,500 cubic yards. Yes. And I think the biggest question of all of this was the one that Beth asked, which was, you know, by reducing the protections, are we going to trigger a rate increase in this county? And you're telling us the answer is no, and you're telling us that you've checked with FEMA, who has told you the answer is no. That's correct. So, okay. How about, um, if I may? Yeah. If I may. Um, commercial or industrial development located within a commercial industrial areas 
period in the public interest of promoting economic development in targeted commercial industrial districts. Such developments are waived from the cut and fill requirements of yeah, this just section. Scra scratch just scratch it. it. We don't need to wordsmith it. We just scratch it. <coughs> Qualify for the waiver. All the following requirements must be met, and that remains unchanged. I would suggest that we approve it with the understanding that you may do some wordsmithing, because I don't want you to do your wordsmithing sitting right here. No, but we eliminate any any yeah, any there's discomfort. There's a lot of, a lot of <coughs> words in yeah. there. I don't think we need to say why we're changing a, a ordinance in the middle of the ordinance. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think we're good. Mm -hmm. If you approve the language, I think we're good. Yep. Sorry, that's good. Excellent point. So, I'm hearkening back to Hurricane when we had the hurricanes 04, 05, and we did the Rock Ridge septic to sewer. And first FEMA said, yes, it's approved. Then they said, oh, wait a minute, uh, we're changing our minds. It's no longer approved. We're gonna try and decertify it. And you're gonna have to pay your money back. What, <clears throat> what guarantee or protection do we have for the future, when they say, oh, you changed your floodplain ordinance, you can say, hey, but wait a minute, here, we've got a letter, we've got something in writing where you said it was okay, it wouldn't adversely affect us. Well, we, I, we could probably get that before we move forward to the board of county commissioners to have that in presentation. Yeah, yeah, we, we probably could get something. <clears throat> uh, some, some, some issue, I mean, there's obviously no insurances anywhere on anything, totally. I mean, they could call you tomorrow and tell you they're dropping your insurance. What can you do? I mean, even with a brand new roof. Um, we, we have done very, very thorough research that simply changing this ordinance <clears throat> isn't gonna have the impact. The reason being, not a lot of guys, A, can bite at this. You know, looking at 0.3% of all potential land that's just potentially can bite at it. And of those, a lot of this stuff is built out already, doesn't need an exemption, doesn't need a cut and fill waiver, not bring a new industry in, yada, yada, yada. So it's a small portion of the 0.3% of all the parcels in the county that, that this could impact. And I think that was taken into consideration in the CRS calculation. So, but I think we, we will definitely document whatever we did to do this. And, you know, Jason Brown, a former budget director, he wouldn't have green-lighted this if he thought it would have any financial impact on the county. I'm comfortable that since we have an open dialogue with them, um, we'll do our due diligence and get. Yeah, we'll find something. We'll, we'll, we'll find something that, that that from the appropriate agency that will give us that moving forward. And as you as you fine tune that, I, I see it as two different levels of, of inquiry. One is we get a community rating system score, <clears throat> and based on that score, we've now got a five. I guess the first question would be does this waiver, the existence of this waiver, reduce our score? It may not reduce it enough to bring us from a five to a four, but does it still reduce our score? Um, because it might. That, it might. You know, it, that. The overall number may reduce. Yeah. Um, I think, I think it, it may. I think there's a very good chance that it just, may. Just but I think the preliminary. Just close to a boundary of five and four such right. that. I, I think that that. Flip up in the future changes things or something like that. I, and I think that's, a, that's an absolutely fair statement. And I think that's in fact very, uh, is a very real possibility. But as I understand it the way that it was explained to me by a very intelligent man named Andy Subcheck, <laughs> um, the difference in that amount from where we are when the number was reduced to get to a lower score is, is it, there's a large distance to get there. And the impact is not great enough to change the number overall. Yeah, I, that's my understanding as well. Right. It was, yeah, it was a pretty big undertaking to get from the six to the five, and it's gonna be very, very, very few jurisdictions. It's not just county, cities are rated as well. Uh, we have a lower rating than the city of Real Beach. We have a lower rating than our adjacent counties. We are among the lowest counties in the state. I think only one or two have a lower rating than us. Low is good, by the way. <laughs> so. It's, um, and I think the lowest jurisdiction in the state is one of the keys, and they did some like Herculean efforts. They, they actually built their roads up, which is kind of weird. So you're looking out your window and you're looking right at the road uh, on some of these things. This is Key Largo in some areas. So they surcharged all the roads, you know, so that the roads at least would be in rising seas still available. And they, they I think they only got to a three. Mm -hmm. Something like that, yeah. Bill, are you happy with a <clears throat> letter in hand before this goes to the commission, or you still have some severe reservations? 
No, uh, my reservations are not severe. I just have reservations when you create an ordinance based on one example. And that always kind of makes me itch a little bit. And with our previous experience with, oh no, you're okay, go ahead, and then a new administration or a new set of eyes falls on everything, and it's like, hey, wait a minute. Um, you know, it, it, that, that always gives me pause for concern. So a letter help? Yeah, a, a letter would be very helpful. I, I would believe a letter would, would be very helpful, and at least we'd be able to go back to them and say, hey, wait a minute, here's this letter that somebody wrote in 2022. That's why we went ahead with this. Yeah. But you, okay. yes, I, I'm, I'm yeah, okay. We'll, we'll try to get that. I mean, you look at it from the standpoint of the rating agencies. I mean, there's 67 yeah, I, counties, probably 3,500 jurisdictions in the state seeking this. I'm not sure they have the on-demand capacity to evaluate each and every. There's something like 2,000 points in our 20 categories. Uh, you, well, hey, will this affect it? Will that affect it? We'll try to get something. Um, I don't know what the analysis was, but Andy's very thorough that determined this would not have an impact. He probably got an email to that effect. Maybe he compared it to another jurisdiction's de minimis impact, but I'll, I'll, we'll try to get something. I would rather not waiting for a letter from a, a bureaucracy I can't even name hold up something that might help a guy open his business up. Just me. Okay, this is a public hearing, so I will open the public hearing. Five, four, three, yeah, no two, public one. Public hearing is closed. Um, I got groceries on that chair there. Okay, we, we have a motion to move to approve. Second. We got a second, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Uh, Commissioner Mar Matters, uh, Alan, the floor is yours. Yes, <clears throat> I wanted to say this is a significant day for me. Um, this is the end of my eight years on planning and zoning, um, which has been a great experience. But actually the uh, significance goes beyond that. Uh, we moved here in 1980. In 1985, the county commission appointed me to something called the Indian River County, uh, Indian River County Environmental Control Hearing Board. And I sat on that for 25 years until the Board of County Commissioners appointed me to county attorney. So I resigned the board and came here uh, as county attorney. When I resigned, I served in that position for parts of four uh, calendar years. And <clears throat> I resigned that position and they appointed me here. So I'm now completing eight years here. Now the interesting thing about that is, first of all, it totals 37 consecutive years without a, an, an off year. And number two, those meetings have all been in this room on this dais. Uh, I also chaired of those, what, 37 years, I chaired 29 years of those meetings, which was quite a, a history. Um, I should also mention that during six years of that period, the Board of County Commissioners appointed me to another group called the Indian River County School Readiness Coalition, is what it was called at that time. And I chaired that for five of the six years that I served on that. So my cumulative to totals of serving on county boards, commissions, coalitions is 43 years of which, let's say I got that, I had to write them down because I couldn't remember all the numbers. 34 of those years were served as chair. So tonight is the end of all that. Okay, uh, I've had a great time, enjoyed it a lot. I wanna thank the county commissioners who appointed me to those positions. Um, I want to additionally thank county staff for helping me through all this. It was a great time. Thank you very much. Alan, I think we owe you. Yes, thank thank you, you for your Absolutely. Absolutely. Well Absolutely. Thank you, sir. And, and I, I'll just add, we as Americans or I don't know, maybe human beings, we don't like to use our brains. That's why reality TV exists. That's why video games exist. Alan, I've never had an encounter with you once where I didn't end up having to use my brain. And I feel like I've just done mental push-ups. You know, you've, <laughs> you've, you've asked critical questions. You've made me look at things that I have looked at and then reconsider how I've looked at them. And that's always the case. And I really want to thank you for that. Because although, you know, my brain's a little sore and I'm going to have to go and rest it when I get home, um, 
I feel like I'm better for it. And the next project I take on, I'm going to be looking at it in different ways. And I think that's how we progress. And I really want to thank you for it. Oh, very good. It was a good time. And you're going to be impossible to replace. <laughs> Absolutely. <Impossible. clears throat> I, will, <clears throat> I will make this point. The only reason I resigned, or I, I didn't resign, I asked Joe Fleischer not to appoint me, reappoint me to this, this board, is because other things in my life are pulling me away from the community too often to attend what I consider to be the proper number of meetings. I should be attending 90% of the meetings, and I'm attending maybe 60% of the meetings, and that's just not right. Now, on the other hand, one of the major things pulling me away from this community is something well involving the golf tournaments of the PGA Tour and NBC, and my knee's not great. So I don't know how much longer I'll be able to do that, but it might be, you know, three or four years, I probably couldn't come back to this board unless <laughs> pathway. I'd love to, but I may come back to some other committee at that point. We'll find a place for you. <laughs> Guaranteed. You want to join the tax? Thank you again, sir. <laughs> yep. Thank you. Oh, very good, Alan. Very thank good. Uh, planning matters. Uh, just well, thank uh, thanks, Alan, from from everyone involved in planning and all our predecessors as well. Um, the only other thing I'll let you all know is that the board did at their second and final hearing adopt the commercial automobile parking in the lesser intense commercial districts, which you all uh, recommended approval way back in September, and then we had some setbacks with the hurricanes, but it went to the board for first hearing in November and final hearing this past Tuesday, so that's now fully adopted. And that's it for me. Uh, we, will no, we don't have a second meeting in December because it's the Christmas Eve Eve, I believe, and um, we'll, we'll probably be looking at having at least one meeting in January, whether it's the first or second meeting, I'm not sure yet. And it will be at 6 p.m. from here, here on out. Thank you. Thank you. Attorney Matters? None, sir. Mr. Chairman, I have a quick, I hope. Uh, Make it quick. <laughs> yes, well, I'm ready to run. Well, a lot of people are asking me about a couple different items, uh, one of which is in the city, and that has to do with the suitability of a huge storage building just to the east of the police station, and um, evidently the zoning allows it. And I, w I don't know if we could have the same thing or if we have an area like that, but it, I just wanted to uh, get a reaction to the idea that maybe a huge storage building like that would only be suitable in a light industrial area. Or we, we have uh, quite a number of controls for self-storage that is uh, unintentionally and intentionally uh, limiting in where they can be. And I, I can assure you, if you talk to some of the storage folks I've talked to, they would agree that they would prefer they be a little bit more, uh, less regulatory. So I can't say that we, we won't see the same proliferation, so to speak, but we have a lot more controls in place in our, our existing zoning code. Well, good. Uh, I hope the city can change in that, in that fashion. And the other thing is people are asking me uh, if you can tell me uh, why uh, the Public say 82nd and 60 is progressing so slowly. Is that a... Um, There's a whole <laughs> lot of variables going on with that. Like, that's all I can say at this point, but I'd be happy to talk to you offline. Can't say, well. can't say. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. This meeting and 2022 are adjourned. Right. Okay. Very good. I'm glad you made it. I'm glad you made it.